What is going on with y'all, man? It is Black Balloon, and I'm coming back with another video. So y'all already know what's going on. All right, y'all. Now we're here for the highly requested video about the 1017 curse. You know, Gucci main, Gucci man. Y'all already know Gucci label 1017, right? Now, over time, a lot of people ask me to do a video about this. I just, I never felt the need to. But, you know, obviously since the recent news and passing of Love Enchanting, the artist that was formerly signed to Gucci's label 1017, since she has passed, it's become, it's become the hottest topic on the internet. A lot of people over the last couple of days asked me to drop a video about it, give my opinion. So I figured, why not? It's a very interesting topic because we get to dive into a couple of different things. Um, and I think her passing away, it brings a lot more meaning to what's actually going on in the generation that we live in, especially with younger artists who are promoted in the industry, you know, whether or not they have a big name or, you know, just a local artist or, you know, whatever you want to call it. This brings up a lot of different topics that are really serious when it comes to drug addiction, when it comes to the industry, when it comes to insurance policies, when it comes to labels, you know, who don't give a damn about you. But this more goes into a very serious topic, and that's obviously drug addiction and promoting it. And also and also the power of the tongue. You know, there's a lot of different things that, you know, we got to talk about with this video. Um, and I've been waiting for things to come out before I actually drop this video. So I didn't I didn't want to miss things and make multiple videos, you know. So I think right now is a good time to go ahead and tackle what's been coming out, especially the guy that she spent her last days with and. So I'm not sure if this was her current boyfriend or her manager. I'm going to say, you know, maybe he was both. Not really sure. But we're going to use this time to go ahead and jump into Love Enchanting. Um, I want to play the live that her boyfriend did. He just put out, I'm assuming, today or yesterday. And, you know, we'll just get into the things that are surrounding her death. And, you know, later on in the video, we'll go more and to the artists of 1017, you know, whether they're still signed or they've been let go by the label. So with that being said, y'all, check this out. Because I feel I took on most of the pressure of her career. Like, if she didn't make it, I would be the blame. So it was me that was pushing the hardest to make everything happen so shit wouldn't fall. Because if everything fall fail it was gonna be me they're gonna say johnny you the you shouldn't have been fucking with this nigga woo -woo. and that's what i was trying to do i was trying to make sure i gave nobody reason no reason to say it was me that was my whole little ordeal so when it happened it was a it was like a weight off my back like finally because being from fort worth nothing happens for nobody so it was like when that happened it was an accomplishment like what the fuck it happened dope you know what I'm saying? But, you should feel proud. Yeah, but I didn't have time to feel proud because two weeks later, I got cut out the situation. Okay, now. Okay, but let me ask this. How important do you feel like you were to her career blossoming who she is? How important? Yeah. If I didn't exist, she wouldn't exist. That's how wow. much. That's how. If, that's if you didn't important. exist, she wouldn't exist. She wouldn't exist. But how did, what did you do to impact her so much that you felt like if it wasn't for me, you wouldn't be here? Pretty much anything you can ever think of an artist is supposed to do for themselves, I had to do for her. I took it. I took an image. I took a face. And I pretty much put everything together, what I thought people would love. The music that I thought people would attract to. 
I posted the, the 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 sexual content that people would attract to on Instagram just to build a page. Yeah, but you said something. You said everything that an artist should do for themselves. Yeah. So you saying that she didn't she actually do doing, anything. No. You did it all. No, I mean she had a. a what what she did had, she? What part did she play? And what part did you play? The face and the voice. That's all she played with she the was face. She was the face and the voice. What record labels do for artists is what I was doing by myself. A&R had, and all that. Everything. I had 10 jobs in one. I was writing the songs, recording the songs, mixing the songs, marketing the songs. So she didn't write her own songs? No, I mean, she wrote her own songs. I don't want to take credit away from what she did do. She did write songs. But... There's a difference between a good song and great songs and hit okay, songs. Okay, so you critiqued her song. I critiqued her style to okay. where it was like, when I met her, she probably had a, 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 a EP on SoundCloud with like 25 plays, but I seen the vision and I took what her vision was and I added to it and together we made motherfucking How did y'all meet? How did, how did, that's what I was about to ask. It was on Facebook. She was just like known in Fort Worth, in Dallas, Fort Worth as a... As a pretty face on Facebook, um, Snapchat, shit like that. And um, I just found her and I heard the music. I told her to send me something. She sent me a song. She had a nice voice. And then from there on, I just hit her up and told her to come to the studio. And that's how we met. And, and boom. At that, hold on. At that time, did you have any other artists you were working with? Yeah, I was working with this artist at the time called Na Lil Nana, Kiana. And she had a song called Beat Up The Pot that kind of got got popular around that time uh, and that's what really attracted Channing to what I had going on because okay. she seen Kiana you know, and she knew Kiana and she seen Kiana growing, growing. You know, scaling mm -hmm. so she was like I gotta figure out what's going on over here so that's how she got in the mix with me so you like working with females it's just I seen the vision before Cardi B and everybody came out I seen that mm -hmm. females were gonna be the next wave so I was putting together strippers and making them rap and saying, hey, we're going to talk about what y'all lifestyle is at the strip mm -hmm. club on album. So before the City Girls, I was trying to create the City Girls. A lot of y'all may have your own opinion about those two clips that we just watched, right? Now, what seemed, you know, and, and I'm just going to imagine the come up between them two based off of the story he's told, what seemed as something that was very genuine to begin with, you know, because he's saying him as a manager slash artist himself, he recognized the wave and he knew it was going toward females, which was very true. A lot of female rappers, you know, are seeing popularity and money that they've never seen before. You know, um, has it has it completely changed as far as how it happens? No, it hasn't. And I think she's a primary example of that and I'll get to what I mean by that in a minute especially with what Charleston White had to say about her as well considering they're from the same city as I said what seemed very genuine to begin with might have turned into a bit of jealousy and a bit of like I feel left out as far as you know someone gaining success and maybe not completely leaving you behind but the things they start to have access to, you no longer have access to because you're not needed. And you could kind of sense that in his tone and in his demeanor when he talked about her. He said two weeks after they basically got their big break. Now, I don't know if that was her signing to 1017. He said two weeks later he was cut out the deal. And that might have been the contract to 1017. So obviously that was behind Epic Records and 1017 because that's the parent label of 1017. Obviously they they wanted nothing to do with him as a manager. They didn't need him, all they needed was her. She was the one signing the contract. She was the one basically, you know, in a sense signing her life away. Although six months ago, she ended that deal with 1017 and Epic. And speaking of the number six, if I'm not mistaken, it was six months ago um, even though I didn't find anything official, but, you know, upon my research, I saw that she parted ways from the label, um, I guess, due to contract issues with 1017 six months ago. And, you know, obviously we have this picture on the screen, you know, which I just want to get to this real quick because this is very spiritual what we are looking at as far as her name being enchanting 
which is a play off of her real name and her having the all C and I in the middle of her neck with, you know, ironically wings attached to it. And basically the Medusa head that also has an all seeing eye right at the top of her head, you know, and she has the snakes and everything all over her chest. We all know enchanted or enchanting is basically being related to a magic spell. You know, this is something that's very spiritual, you know, something that is very attractive, very pleasing um, in her sense could be very sexually attractive. You know, those spirits that were attached to her, you know, gave her that name, although she says one of her friends gave her that name. But, you know, she she embodied it. She became an enchanting female. You know, and whether she knew it or not, she started to place spells on her fans, on her listeners. Because look what she decided to call herself. Look what she decided to tattoo on her neck. The all C and I. With a bunch of serpents traveling on her chest. The Medusa head. So look what she invited literally into her body. She has a spell right there on her chest, y'all. So this is why I said earlier in the video, this video would also be a lot about the power of the tongue and the fact that people put spells on themselves without even really knowing. You know, because you have to think about it when most artists don't get their artist name tattooed on them. Like the way she has enchanting tatted on her neck with the all seeing eye right up under it and the serpents, the snake, the Medusa. This is a spell like this is a ritual. She knew what she was doing right here. You know, maybe she got coached up on some, you know, occultic stuff when she got into the industry. Who knows who she might have met? But this tattoo is very telling of spiritually who she became, whether she knew it or not. And this plays a huge role into her demise at an early age of 26 years old. That's why I said it may have started off genuine between them two. But he definitely felt some kind of way about things happening the way that it did. And especially him saying she wouldn't exist if he didn't exist. He feels that he basically made her, you know, without him, she wouldn't have became enchanting. She wouldn't have signed to Gucci, so on and so on. Before we get into her death and the guy Johnny a little bit more, this is why I brought up Charleston White. Now, y'all may have saw this, and this is kind of giving us an idea of the situation that she landed herself in and what she decided to promote as an artist or how she was actually used like most women are these days in the industry. Charleston White. Now, some of y'all might not agree with what he said because the young lady did just lose her life from an apparent overdose. But listen to what he said. It almost goes to what the guy was talking about. He said, this young lady is from my city. I'm very familiar with her rap success, and it wasn't a success. I mentioned her situation years ago. She was an F toy with talent who hardly put out music but posted a lot of social media pics. If someone died doing what they like to do, which is getting high, then why should anyone be sad for that person? She died a dope fiend, just like the rest of them in the music industry. I told y'all they was just effing on her and wasn't putting no music out. Now, we all know with this industry stuff, you know, guy managers who like to manage a lot of girls, they use their status. You know, he said he didn't really have much going on. But she did see that he was working with a, a female artist who was already doing something. So it's left up to speculation if he had relationships with her as well. And he basically told you that I would get with the girl so I can control the situation because it makes it easier for me. Because they'll want to see the vision more. But if we're not in a relationship, they're not really going to pay attention to it like that, especially if you don't have something going on. So him saying that, and you you already know how, like, 
you know, men can be like predators with that kind of stuff. You know, really, at the end of the day, he said it. He said it. She was known as a cute face. It came out of his mouth. That's just him being, you know, like modest about it. She was already known as like an attractive girl, probably already taken, you know, pictures showing the body all that you check her instagram now it's a bunch of that stuff selling a bunch of sex now you almost got a million followers it becomes even more you know of a process like this is what you do now this is what you promote you make money off of it in a sense it sells you and your music sex it all sells so he told you she was already known as a pretty face charleston white just said it a little bit more blatant you know, she was known as a toy to other men. And as she got more deep into the industry, it might have, you know, exploded even more. And we're not saying that to like pit nothing on her, but this is what women get caught up in when it comes to the industry. You know, it's even more than just the everyday girl who's, you know, who's already out there just normally. And this is how. A lot of women end up in these kind of situations where you just signed your life away and basically, you know, you've punched your ticket to the devil's door and you end up with men like this Johnny guy who always who's already, you know, showing signs that he may have something to do with her death. And it may not just be something where, you know, she just overdosed and that was just what it was. But. You know, before we go all into that, we're going to go ahead and check out this live clip of him explaining the situation that happened in the hospital. Now, I had to screen record this from somebody else's page, um, Hood Educated. I don't know if y'all see his channel or not, but um, he, he put some music behind it. I tried to find the live with no music or nothing like that. I could not find this live. I've been looking for like two hours. I cannot find it. But anyways, y'all, we're going to go ahead and check this out. And I'm going to come back and talk about this a little bit more. Check this out. I'm going to just briefly go through the shit quick. Because I was going to wait until after the funeral to speak the truth on what the hell happened and what's going on with Channing and over the past year or so. I don't know how long it's been since you've been going through this. But I figured out late, very, very late. And I tried to do something about it. So I want y'all to go read the messages first. First, I want to show y'all in the message was being explained to me to give her the pills. <clears throat> now the message y'all are saying, y'all keep saying I said I gave her the pills. No, I don't know where y'all see that I'm saying that at. I keep telling y'all, the family told me to give her the pills. The family told me to give her the pills. Look at the message. If you see the message, I say, it's a bag of that shit left. It's a bag of it left. She hasn't taken pills since Saturday when she was, this is when she was coherent and doing what she wanted to do. She already took that shit Saturday on her own. Sunday, she didn't take shit. When you see the message and they told me what to do, I didn't do it. I still got them all. I still got the same bag that y'all see I said I had. I still got it over here. I didn't give it to her. Now my whole problem with the mother is this that I didn't like. When she died. When she died. I called the 911 first. Boom. After I got off the phone with the paramedics and they got to my apartment because I don't know where y'all think this happened at, but she's been at my house for the last seven days. When the ambulance, when the paramedics got here, 
and they started working on her, I called her mother immediately. That's what you see. Cause I told her, hey, I explained, I couldn't even explain to her, right? Cause I kept breathing, like I couldn't, I ain't never experienced that shit before. I ain't never, so when I'm breathing like that, I'm trying to process and slow down and explain what the fuck is going on, like. If everybody could pray. pray. If I'm trying to tell, I could she was calm. And then it was even making me more dramatic. So I'm like, why are you so calm right now? I'm losing my mind. Her mom calmed me down. Her mom was calm enough to calm me down. And I'm thinking, why are you so calm? I just, I, like, why is everybody acting normal? Why is you acting normal? I'm tripping, I'm losing my mind right now. What the fuck I just seen with my eyes? So they wouldn't let me ride in an ambulance with them because I told the mom I'd drop my location. If you see at 2.30, 2 something, drop my location, said, whoop, whoop, we're going to this hospital. I drove up to the goddamn hospital. They wouldn't let me inside the waiting room where you see where I did that video that was in the lobby. Cause it took her, it took her mama two hours in 30 minutes just to tell me she was on the way. It took her two hours and 30 minutes just to tell me she was on the way. So they won't let me in the back. I'm in the front of the hospital by myself, nobody by myself. At this point, the doctors can't even get in touch with the mama. I can't get in touch with the mama. I don't know what's taking so long. This is before she told me she was on the way. Cause I'm thinking as soon as I tell her, drop everything that you're doing, come now. No, they took two hours and 30 minutes to say they was on the way. Then took another 45 minutes. So I was there by myself. So when I didn't have nobody else to call and nobody was picking up the phone, I decided to go live, calm myself down, talk to everybody and say, if everybody could just pray. Somebody called me while I was on live. I forget I even did that. I was losing my mind. I was by myself. No, I'm calling people, nobody's picking up. Everything that I said, I got the receipts to prove it. Look at the text messages that I sit here, I'm, tell, I'm asking her because they won't let me in. So I'm like, have y'all made it there yet? I'm asking, have they made Look at the timestamps. Everything that I'm saying checks out. I was there by myself for hours before they showed up and I'm trying to figure out why everyone is so fucking calm. Why am I the only person losing my shit? Everybody's trying to calm me down. All right, so based off of what we just heard. Now, I was a little confused because he said, which is why I slowed that particular part down. He said when she died and he called 911. So they were still at his house. So, you know, if I'm not mistaken, in one of the texts to Enchanting's mom, he said that she's not breathing. So, you know, maybe, you know, she had already went into cardiac arrest, if that's exactly what's happened. And, 
you know, had a very faint, low pulse, and he thought she had died already at the house. Called 911, you know, blah, 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 right? Because she was put on life support, so, you know, obviously she she may have been a vegetable by that time, you know, or would have become that um, because I'm sure she had no brain activity and probably no oxygen getting to her brain, which is why she was on life support anyway, because, you know, she wouldn't she wouldn't be able to live without being hooked up to tubes at that point. So I'm going to assume that's why they pulled the plugs. Another thing he said was he was in the lobby when he made that video. But to me, before I even looked into all this, when I actually saw that video two days ago, it looked like he was sitting right next to her. Because what else would he be looking looking at when he was looking to his left? And in, in the full video, you could see, you know, you could see like the IV machine and stuff behind him. I don't think they have that in lobbies and stuff. I'm pretty sure. I know they don't. I've been in the lobby multiple times in hospitals. So I thought that was a little weird. Because, I, you know, I don't know if to fully just be like, oh, he's lying about where he was when he made that video. But I don't think he was sitting in a lobby when he did that live. Because what was he looking at? It looked like he was looking directly at her. You know, or, you know, he was faking a panic attack because there wasn't any real emotion there if we want to speak about his side of the story. You know, there was no real tears there. You know, um... I thought it was definitely eerie that he, he's showing a lot of text messages between them two, between him and her mom. You know, he said he had a sad dream on May 29th. I want you to be OK. She said, what's wrong? He said, I don't know. I worry about you. It makes me sad. And then. Her next thing was I quit doing drugs. Sober chant. This was on the 29th of May. So, you know, we're talking about two weeks ago. So she automatically assumed that he was talking about her being on drugs and he had an eerie feeling that something was about to happen to her. You know, you, you could take this as, you know, it being just that he kind of had a premonition. You know, um. And she knew what he was talking about because she knows what she's been going through. And obviously from the text messages with the mom, clearly this is not the first time she's been through this. The mom said, do she got any of them guys left? If she do, give her all of what is. If she doesn't have any, I'm on the way. She just gonna have to wait till I get there. He says she do. It's another bag of that shit. She was just feeling like she needed to go to the hospital, but she fell asleep now. And supposedly, I think if I'm not mistaken, I saw somewhere where he said he did give her some of the pills, but she threw it up and she wanted him to go get like fruit and stuff for her. The mom in that same text said. That's because she has to do a certain amount or she will feel like that when it's time for her to get back up. When she do, just give her all that. So clearly, and it looks like he might have deleted a couple messages in between that because it went to I'm here. Are you close? Unless these screenshots are backwards. But clearly she's been through that before. Now, I don't know if she's OD'd before or she just has episodes where she's trying to quit and she has to get back on it because the withdrawals are too strong and it's damn near killed her before. Maybe that explains why the mom and everyone else in the family was calm and trying to calm him down because they thought this was another episode and she would be OK. So at this point of the story, it will be left up to. You know, I, I guess when things further come out about how she actually died, you know, whether this was. Withdrawals or she was you know, an actual OD off of taking something again. You know, a lot of people have been saying lace with fentanyl. She spent the last seven days, as he said, with him. And he's saying she hasn't done any drugs since last Saturday. 
But I, I know I could have sworn I saw something, a screenshot of something that said he gave her a couple of them, but she threw them up. Then he said he had the rest of the pills still there at his house. So, you know, this is, is kind of very confusing about what's actually going on. And I don't think her saying that she's sober now means that she's just completely off of it. You know, I think this was probably her trying for another time to get sober. And maybe the withdrawals is what actually killed her. Maybe it wasn't something where she popped a bunch of pills and something was laced with fentanyl and she just OD'd. You know, maybe she died from the withdrawals. It were too strong this time. You know, I'm not sure. We'll have to wait until further information comes out. But I guess at this part of the story, this is where you would take it down multiple, you know, theories. I don't even know if I could take it back to Gucci and a sacrifice or, you know, an insurance payout for the label because she'd already left the label. You know, I guess that question comes down to who owns her music now, you know, or whoever owns the music, who are they going to sell the music to? You know, did she have some kind of insurance policy? I don't know if she was signed I, or I think she just signed a deal that was for one album. You know, so there's a lot of different, you know, theories you can throw out there as far as everything that may have been going on in her career and you know, if this might have been more sinister than we know. But I think for right now, we may have well just leave it where it's at until more information comes out about her death and how she actually died. You know, we can take this part of the video and just go into a couple of more artists that were signed to 1017 and that died signed to 1017, especially Big Scar, because he had a direct relationship with her. Now, this part of the video, I'm not going to make too long, but I do want to talk about two artists in specific that was a part of 1017. Now, here's just a quick list of, you know, all the artists that are either in jail or dead. It says Pooh Shiesty serving eight years, and um, his was basically for multiple shootings. Big Scar, which was a cousin of Pooh Shiesty, passed away from an OD. We're going to get into him in a second. Enchanting, as we know, she just died from an OD. Fujiano serving five years. Hot Boy West serving 15 years. K Sade dropped by the label. Roboy, Boy, Rob Boy, whatever you want to call him, dropped by the label. Hood Rich Pablo Juan is also facing Rico charges. He's been locked up for years now. And I uh, guess maybe an honorable mention, <laughs> if we even want to mention him at all, um, Lil Wop. Now, we're going to have to get into him a little bit to end this video as well. What I found interesting from Big Scar and Enchanting, now, they did have some kind of, you know, thing going on. I don't know if it was a relationship or anything like that. I'm not sure. Y'all let me know in the comments if they actually dated. This is what's kind of weird about it. Big Scar was 22 years old. He died in December 2022. He died from a prescription pain med OD. What's weird is that Big Scar overdosed on a Thursday at his girlfriend's house in Memphis. Y'all, same thing with Enchanting. She overdosed cardiac arrest. You know, that's what we're assuming right now at her boyfriend's house. That's that's crazy. They they both died basically the opposite of each other. She died with her boyfriend, if that's what you wanted to call them. He died with his girlfriend. They were a part of the same label. Now, this is just a little bit more information about Big Scar. His uncle said he did not know when his nephew got the meds, but he says Big Scar faced several traumatic experiences in his life, including being shot and suffering a serious car accident injury. The rapper got his stage name from the car accident when he was 16. It left a big scar on his body when he was thrown through a windshield. In the 2020 shooting, Big Scar was struck by a bullet that traveled up his spine and he needed surgery to remove his appendix. The uncle says Big Scar also battled depression, citing the death of the rapper's grandmother as something that he took very hard. But once again, a lot of this stuff, you know, can be left up to the industry that these guys was a part of. And what's now becoming a full curse behind the label of 1017 and Gucci. 
And we already know the whole thing with Gucci is another story in itself from back when, you know, the CIA had to come out and say that this was not a clone of the real Gucci man. I still don't believe that is the real Gucci. With the videos we've done about cloning, go back and check them out. There's no way. I don't care if he sounds like Gucci. All that stuff that came out about Gucci, y'all, there's so much to that. You know, how can we really believe anything when it comes to these artists? Now, a lot of people say that Big Scar was really on perks like that. Like, you know, I think I did see that video where he like fell asleep standing up or something like that. You know, I'm sure he was. And I'm very sure Enchanting was on it as well. It's obvious her mom was bringing her pills. So, of course. But we already know how ODs and drugs are used in industry sacrifices are, you know, or, you know, these these people, like I said earlier, they're already punching their ticket to the devil's door. They're already halfway there. One foot is in. All it takes is OD across the news and boom, sacrifice complete. You know, who knows, especially when you sign to 1017, which, you know, seems like a label that's just full of you know, I don't know what you either like you either going to jail for years or you're dying. You know, you either blaming this on Gucci for recruiting these kind of people, these kind of artists, knowing that, you know, either way it go, he's going to get something from them. He's going to recoup any any way, you know, and Big Scar died signed to 1017. So he owns that music still. Push Icy still signed. You know? Hot Boy West still signed. So a lot of these people, you know, he's still going to make money off of. And now to top this video off, y'all remember this guy Lil Wap, right? This was who he was, you know, before he decided to become, you know, this cat version, you know, or this trans version. And he was signed to Gucci, you know. Remember, he started talking shit about Gucci. You know, um, saying Gucci wasn't doing nothing for him, the label, this and that. You know, at one point he was fully trying to become, you know, transgender. Now, if you check his Instagram, he's back to his regular self. He's deleted all of this. You know, I don't know if this was a stage for him. He was wearing wigs. You know, he got on bathing suits with the little things that women wear, you know, lingerie, all that good stuff. Look what the industry turned him into, you know, or you could say this was what he was to begin with but this guy named himself Lil Wop he was signed to Gucci Goo Wop Big Wop so this is the kind of stuff that comes from his label like for a second I forgot about this looking at these photos this is wow this is crazy look at this man he got on cat cat ears look at this what look at this my God, I forgot about this. This is I'm I'm you know I'm I haven't even looked at these yet. I'm clicking on this as I'm doing this video live. This is just crazy. This enough. I and mean, this is it. This enough right here. This is all you need to see. You don't even need to see nothing else to know that you do not want to be a part of that industry. And I guess for us to go ahead and wrap this video up, you know, maybe if more information comes out, I'll definitely jump on it and we'll get, you know, a part two going. But um to end this video. You know, um, you know, I don't want to be completely heartless. I do want to say rest in peace to Big Scar and Enchanting. And, um, you know, because at the end of the day, they both were young. You know, Scar was 22. She was 26. And, you know, this is this is basically the end result of what we live in today, y'all was being promoted, you know, um, if you want to take these as real ODs and it wasn't anything sinister, a lot of these people don't have no help. They have people around them that just tells them yes and encourages the things that they love to do. And they're surrounded by people who love to do exactly what they love to do. And if you're making money, they're not going to tell you to stop. They're not going to tell you to get healthy. They want you to be exactly who you are so they can continue to benefit from being around you. And it's the world we live in. And it goes for women and it goes for men, too. And it's also something, you know, they chose. 
because they was chasing that fame, that money, and ultimately the devil. You know, whether they knew it or not. And honestly, it's sad to see. Because that's an industry that, you know, chews you up and spit you right back out. And another one will come along and, you know, this cycle will continue. Especially when you're dealing with devils. You want to wear that chain? You want everything <laughs> to gain? <laughs> you're going to pay the price for that fame. And it's pretty much that simple. All right, y'all. So, man, uh, let me know what y'all think about this, man. It's been going, you know, all over the Internet. You know, um, please let me know what y'all think in the comments. Hope y'all enjoyed that video. Got another video for y'all coming up on Sunday. Um, uh, yeah, Sunday. I should have that video ready. With that being said, man, it's Black Balloon, and I'm going to see y'all soon.